next subsection of the rules, specifically conflicts of interest. So I would like to point out that this subsection of the rules is the most highly tested section of the rules. It makes up 12 to 18% of your total exam. So the reason I stress this is because this area of the rules should be your absolute first priority if you're trying to maximize your chances of success on the exam. So while you should never ignore any portion of the rules, it's very helpful if you remember how important each are with respect to the total uh, number of questions you'll see on your exam. So this area of the rules should be your number one priority. So much like the other sections, I'm not going to cover every rule, but instead just those that we've received lots of questions on um, or that we see tested in rather tricky ways. So the first rule I want to talk about is current client conflicts. So the rule tells us that a lawyer shall not represent a client if the representation involves a concurrent conflict of interest. A concurrent conflict of interest exists in two scenarios. So to stop there, you should memorize these two scenarios because therefore it creates a current client conflict. The first scenario is if the representation of one client will be directly adverse to another client. So this could be as straightforward as representing a plaintiff and a defendant in a matter. You can't do that. Their interests are directly adverse. So let's look at some of our examples here and then I'll give you one not in the outline. Your first example says, if a lawyer asks to represent the seller of a business in negotiations with the buyer who's represented by the lawyer, not in the same transaction, but in another unrelated matter, the lawyer should not undertake the representation without the informed consent of each client. Why? Because while it's not the exact same matter, like in my first example, uh, the interests of these clients are directly adverse and therefore it would create that current client conflict. Similarly, though, on the other hand, simultaneous representation in unrelated matters of clients whose interests are only economically adverse, such of uh, representation of competing economic enterprises in unrelated litigation does not ordinarily constitutes a conflict of interest and may not require consent of the respected parties. So I just take this to mean that maybe based on the type of law you practice, you represent a certain type of client or a certain type of business. And those businesses might generally be competitors of one another. Um, so that doesn't mean though that you automatically have a conflict of interest. Just because someone's interests are economically adverse doesn't automatically mean that their interests are directly adverse to one another. To give you one more example, not in the outline, let's say a lawyer regularly represents an airline with respect to personal injury lawsuits. And one of the airline's employees approaches the lawyer and asks the lawyer to represent her in a wrongful termination lawsuit against the airline. Can the lawyer do this? And the answer is no. Um, this instance is a classic example of the parties having directly adverse interests and therefore a current client conflict exists. So while it's not the same matter, one lawsuit would be that wrongful termination suit and the other set of lawsuits are personal injury, it doesn't matter. In one lawsuit, the lawyer is going to be representing the, the airline company and then in another lawsuit, the lawyer would be suing the airline company and that's problematic. So no, that would not be allowable. Now, getting back to our rule, we said that current client conflicts exist in two scenarios. We've talked about the first. The second says that there's a significant risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibility to another client, a former client, a third person, or by the personal interests of the lawyer. So turning to our examples here, it says a lawyer asked to represent several individuals to form a joint venture is likely to be materially limited in the lawyer's ability to recommend or advocate for all possible positions that each might take because of the lawyer's duty of loyalty to all of them. The conflict in effect forecloses alternatives that would have otherwise been available to the client. So pausing here for a second, because all of these individuals hired the lawyer in a joint enterprise, this duty of loyalty that the lawyer owes runs to all of them equally. So the lawyer can't give advice to each individual person that might not be in the best interest of the other client because the lawyer's duty of loyalty runs to all of them together. So that means this lawyer wouldn't necessarily be able to fully advise them on everything. The next example is a good one about the uh, lawyer's own personal interests. So it says that when a lawyer has discussions concerning possible employment with an opponent of the lawyer's client or with a law firm representing the opponent, such discussions could materially limit the lawyer's representation of a client. 
And I think this is fair. If you're being represented by a lawyer who's in talks with uh, employment opportunities with the opposing party's law firm, you should very much question your lawyer's loyalty. Is it to you or to his or her ability to get a job? So I think that that's an excellent example of a current client conflict by virtue of the lawyer's own self-interests. Now, the rule doesn't stop there, though. If you have a current client conflict, can you ever get around it and move forward with the representation of both of your clients? And the answer is yes, sometimes, if you can fulfill the following four requirements. First, the lawyer has to reasonably believe that they'll be able to provide competent and diligent representation to all of the affected parties. Two, the representation cannot be prohibited by law. Three, the representation does not involve an assertion of a claim by one client against another client represented by that lawyer in the exact same litigation or in other proceedings before a court. And four, each affected client gives their informed consent confirmed in writing. In other words, they've got to sign something. So the big takeaway from this rule is the only way around these current client conflicts is to satisfy all four of these requirements and get each affected client to get their consent in writing. So a few other things I want to tell you. Some states prohibit lawyers from representing two defendants in a capital case. Uh, in these types of cases, this type of representation will be prohibited by law. So the lawyer can't represent both defendants, even if they would have otherwise agreed, because the, the rule above says that it can't be prohibited by law. Turning to another example. A lawyer represents a husband in a business matter where the lawyer obtains confidential information regarding his finances. While the husband's business matter is still pending, wife wants the lawyer to represent her in a divorce action against the man. Lawyer can't represent the wife. This is an unconsentable conflict where the lawyer can only take on the representation of uh, just the husband, even if the husband were to consent to the representation of the wife. Why? Because these clients' interests would be directly um, adverse, not in the same litigation, but in other proceedings in front of a court. So that's our current client conflict. Let's move on to the situation of former client conflicts. So here the rule says, a lawyer who has formally represented a client in a matter shall not thereafter represent another person in that same or a substantially related matter in which the person's interests are materially adverse to the interests of the former client unless the former client gives their informed consent confirmed in writing. So one thing to take away that I didn't mention previously, always keep an eye on who must be giving their informed consent. With current client conflicts, both affected clients gave their informed consent confirmed in writing. Here, former client conflicts require that the former client gives their informed consent confirmed in writing. So a few things to discuss here. Uh, there is some essentially vocab you need to be familiar with. The first few examples we talk about, we'll be talking about the same matter. Then we'll discuss the definition of substantially related and go over some examples there. So your first example talks about how a lawyer could not properly seek to rescind on behalf of a new client a contract drafted on behalf of a former client. That's the perfect classic definition of the same matter. If I draft a contract for you and then you pay me and go on your way, and then someone thereafter comes to me and asks me to represent them, in trying to get out of that contract I drafted, well, clearly your interests are adverse and it's the exact same matter. So I could only do that if you gave your consent. Next, a lawyer who's prosecuted an accused person could not properly represent the accused person in a subsequent civil action against the government concerning that same transaction. Three, a person who's represented multiple clients in a matter may not represent one of those clients against the others in a same or substantially related matter after a dispute arises amongst them, unless all of them give their informed consent. Because when you represent a group of people, the law is kind of treating them like all as, as one. Um, so we really have to be careful here that the clients know what they're getting themselves into. For instance, they can't uh, claim privilege against each other. So here, if a dispute arises and one of the parties asks you to represent just one of them against the others in the group, you can't do that because the others in the group are, are technically your former clients, so they would have to consent. So I said we would talk about some vocab here. The rule utilizes the word substantially related. So what does that mean for purposes of this rule? Well, the comments tell us that this means the transactions or actions involve the same transaction or legal dispute, or if there's otherwise a substantial risk that confidential factual information that would have normally been obtained in the prior representation would materially advance the client's position in the subsequent 
matter. So in other words, if it's not the exact same matter, like that contract example I gave you, you want to double check if there would be information learned with that former client that would hurt, that would help the current client. If that's the case, then they're substantially related matters. So a few examples here, a lawyer who's represented a business person and learned extensive financial information about that person cannot then represent that person's spouse in seeking a divorce. Because while those are not the same matters, they're substantially related because the lawyer has that confidential information that would be very helpful to this uh, spouse in a divorce action. Next example, a lawyer who's previously represented a client in securing environmental permits to build a shopping center would be precluded from representing neighbors seeking to oppose the rezoning of the property on the basis of environmental considerations. However, the lawyer would not be precluded on the grounds of this substantial relationship from defending a tenant of the completed shopping center and resisting an eviction for non-payment of rent. Because in that latter example, they are not the same, nor are they substantially related, meaning there's no risk of shared confidential information there. So to give you an example not in your outline about uh, substantially related, let's say a lawyer helps a woman buy a house. So in other words, the woman has hired the lawyer to represent her in this um, home buying transaction. Woman pays lawyer, they go their own separate ways. Woman is now a former client of lawyers. A woman lives in her house that is subject to a homeowner's association and she pays her homeowner association dues every year for two years. And then the woman loses her job and she can't pay her dues in the third year. So the homeowners association asks the lawyer to represent them in placing a lien on this woman's property for non-payment of her dues. Can the lawyer represent the association in this matter? And the answer is going to be no. While it's not technically the same transaction, that's another classic example of substantially related because there's this risk of uh, confidential information that the lawyer learns while representing the woman that would be relevant and advance the position of the homeowner association. So the next rule that I want to talk about is regarding clients of a lawyer's former firm. So first we'll talk about the rule and then I'll give you an example. It says, a lawyer shall not knowingly represent a person in the same or a substantially related matter in which a firm with which the lawyer was formerly associated had previously represented a client whose interests are materially adverse to that person and about whom the lawyer has acquired protected information under their duty of confidentiality that's material to the matter, unless that former client gives their informed consent confirmed in writing. So to stop there, let's say you work at law firm A, and then you quit and you go get a job at law firm B. At law firm B, you can't represent the clients there at law firm B if they have interests that are materially adverse to the clients that you represented at law firm A. The only way you could do that is if you got that informed consent from those clients at law firm A, and chances are they wouldn't give it to you. So the other thing I want to point out about this rule is uh, lawyers who have general access to client files at a law firm and who participate in, say, discussions regarding law firm cases and their progress are inferred to have confidential information about those clients' cases. So if your fact pattern tells you that a lawyer has access to this information, uh, we should just assume that they have confidential information, which means this rule applies to them. So keep that in mind, meaning even if they didn't handle the matter themselves at law firm A and then they moved to law firm B, because they had access to the information while at law firm A, they can't help those clients at law firm B without getting that informed consent from those clients of law firm A, which again is something that they're likely not going to get. Turning to our next set of rules here, and this time it's about perspective client conflicts. But first of all, who is a perspective client? This way you can be on the lookout for them. So this is someone who consults with a lawyer about the possibility of forming a client-lawyer relationship with respect to a matter. That's who we would call a prospective client. So even when a lawyer-client relationship does not um, end up existing or come to fruition between two people, a lawyer who has learned information from a prospective client shall not use or reveal that information unless there's some sort of exception to the duty of confidentiality. Further, a lawyer shall not represent a client with interests materially adverse to those of a prospective client in the same or substantially related matter if the lawyer has received information from the prospective client that would be significantly harmful to them in the matter except as provided below. So let's just stop there. Um, many law firms offer free consults. So let's say you work at a law firm that does this. 
and someone comes into your office and tells you some information about their case, but they don't end up hiring you. Well, this is unfortunate for a few reasons, mainly because now if the opposing party to their action came to you and wanted to hire you, you technically can't because now you have information about that prospective client and you're not allowed to use it. Uh, the theory is the information you gain from that prospective um, client would be significantly harmful if you were to share it or use it against them. So therefore you can't. So it's uh, really important, which you'll see in a second, I'll stress again, that when you take on these prospective client meetings that you're doing your best to learn as little as possible. So another thing to take away about these prospective client conflicts, much like the other rules here, is that many times these conflict of interest rules are imputed upon all of your other firm members. In other words, um, if one lawyer is disqualified, their whole law firm would be disqualified. Now, there are some exceptions. If you're disqualified for personal conflicts, like religious reasons or a personal, like physical sexual relationship, that's not imputed to other members of your firm, but generally any other type of conflict would be. And again, you can see how this would be problematic because if you're conflicted out, your whole firm in theory would be conflicted out and it would make taking on client cases very challenging. So again, these rules are treating all lawyers in a law firm like they're one person. So how do we get around this prospective client conflict issue? Because clearly it could be quite problematic. Well, the first way we could get around it is getting consent from those affected parties. So this means getting consent from both the affected client and the prospective client, get their informed consent confirmed in writing. So both need it. Remember I said, pay attention to who must consent. Here, both must consent. The second option is a screening option. So here screening requires that the lawyer who has this information took reasonable measures to avoid exposure to more disqualifying information than was reasonably necessary to determine to represent whether, uh, whether to represent the prospective client. And this disqualified lawyer is timely screened from any participation in the matter and he's not given a fee and written notice is promptly provided to that prospective client. So the key takeaway to me here is not just we screen the disqualified lawyer off and we give notice about the screening procedure to the prospective client, but we need to make sure that when the lawyer met with this prospective client, they got as little information as possible. They took steps to make sure they didn't get too much information. So that is key in this rule. The next rule under this subsection that I'd like to discuss is slightly different than some of these former, current, and prospective client conflict rules we've discussed, but it's a conflict of interest rule nonetheless. So a rule says that prior to the conclusion of the representation of a client, a lawyer shall not make or negotiate an agreement, giving the lawyer literary or media rights to a portrayal or an account based in substantial part on information that relates to the representation. So this means if you're representing like a movie star, for instance, and maybe they're having this very hostile, bitter, bitter divorce that's highly publicized and it's being dragged out. And maybe this movie star that you're repping is running out of money and they approach you and say, hey, I'm running out of money. Is there any sort of other arrangement we could come up with? You can't even negotiate any sort of arrangement uh, to even later obtain literary or media rights. The idea is here, you can't even negotiate this, let alone agree to this type of arrangement while the matter is ongoing. And the theory behind this is we wanna make sure the lawyer is properly motivated. You should be motivated to rep your clients um, by only doing what's in their best interest by virtue of their legal position, not by your own self-interests. So if you gain the rights to maybe write a book or a movie about them, you now may want to do other things amidst representing them that might make a really good book or good movie, even if that might not benefit them in the long run. And that's a problem. So that's why we do not want any sort of negotiation or agreement occurring here while the matter is ongoing. The next rule I want to talk about is about uh, malpractice liability and specifically the weighting of it. So the rule here is unique and I'll tell you why. It says that a lawyer shall not make an agreement prospectively limiting the lawyer's liability to a client for malpractice unless the client is independently represented in making the agreement. So I want to stop here. I promise you, if you take my advice, you'll be better for this. This is the only place in all of the rules where your client must be independently represented to enter into one of these agreements. You're going to see throughout um, other areas of the rules here that we're supposed to encourage our clients to seek independent uh, counsel or representation in entering into certain types of agreements. 
But ultimately, if the client does not want to hire a lawyer in these other instances, they don't have to. Here, however, the rule makes it clear that the only way you can ask your client to prospectively waive or limit malpractice is to be independently represented by another lawyer. So if they refuse or if they aren't repped by another lawyer here, then you can't enter into one of these agreements. Now compare that rule to the next. A lawyer shall not settle a claim or potential claim for such liability with an unrepresented client or a former client unless that person is advised in writing of the desirability of seeking advice of independent counsel and given a reasonable opportunity to opportunity to get advice of independent counsel in connection therein. So you can see this is a great example where you're supposed to encourage your client or former client to go get outside independent advice. Uh, and in fact, you're supposed to make that type of recommendation in writing. Um, but ultimately, if they choose not to hire someone and they just want to settle this claim with you, they can. And you would not be in trouble for entering into a settle agreement, settlement agreement after you made this recommendation. So again, to be clear, asking your client to waive malpractice liability is a conflict of interest and they must be independently represented in making such an agreement. Now, the next two rules that I want to talk about speak to a lawyer going from uh, governmental work, so working for the government and then transitioning into private practice and those conflict of interest rules that apply. And then we'll talk about the reverse, someone going from private practice and then shifting gears to work in the government or public sector. So first we talk about government to private. And the rule says, except as the law may otherwise permit, a lawyer who has formerly served as a public officer or the employee of the government is subject to the former client conflict rules. So to stop there, we've already covered that rule. Two, may not otherwise represent a client in connection with the matter in which the lawyer participated personally and substantially as a public officer or employee unless the appropriate government agency gives her informed consent confirmed in writing to the representation. So stopping there, remember, always pay attention to who must give their informed consent confirmed in writing. Here it's the government. You could think of this as like the former client giving your informed consent. The other thing I want to point out is that there's some new vocab being used here that you need to understand how they're defined to be able to apply them to a fact pattern. And the first word we see is the word matter. So please note that the word matter here is narrow and it means a specific set of facts involving a specific set of parties. So look at your example. A lawyer who worked on regulations for an agency when she worked for the government was asked when she moved into private practice to argue that the regulations were not properly applied to a specific party. The lawyer can represent that party because drafting regulations is not a matter because it does not involve specific facts or specific parties. I feel like there's always a question on those basic set of facts, so understanding that definition is helpful. Now, the next uh, kind of phrase you need to be able to define is personally and substantially. So this kind of means as it sounds in its common sense way, this means that the lawyer in question was actually personally involved in the matter. They didn't just rubber stamp something or, or generally oversee it. So to give you a quick example, let's say a lawyer was a senior attorney in the county and she rubber stamped her signature on every case that came through the county lawyer would not be considered to be personally and substantially involved in every single case that she rubber stamped. She's only involved in those ones in which she truly participated in. And I think this portion of the rule makes sense uh, because you would be conflicted out of so many uh, cases in theory um, if this was more, um, if this was defined in a more expansive way. So as it relates to this rule, uh, they go out of their way to tell us that this rule, too, uh, speaks to imputed disqualification scenarios. Much like I said, imputed disqualification applies to so many of, the, of these rules. This is one. So it says that when a lawyer is disqualified from representing, no lawyer in their firm for which they're associated with may knowingly undertake or continue representation in such a matter unless the disqualified lawyer is timely screened from participating in the matter and is given no fee. And two, written notice is promptly given to the government agency to enable it to ascertain compliance with this rule. So in other words, if you're disqualified, your whole firm is too. Remember, these rules treat um, a law firm full of lawyers as one lawyer. Now let's turn to the other part of this rule. If you're transitioning from private work to working for the government, what do the rules say here? So they tell us that 
Except as the, the law may otherwise expressly permit, a lawyer currently serving as a public officer or employee is subject to the present client conflict rules, which we've discussed, and the former client conflict rules, which we've discussed. And they may not participate in a matter in which they participated personally and substantially while they were in private practice or non-governmental work, unless the appropriate governmental agency gives their informed consent confirmed in writing. So I'm going to stop there. Here you see that this rule utilizes the words personally and substantially again, which we've already defined. So that's good. That's on your radar. Second of all, I said, always pay attention to who has to give their informed consent. Good news for you, no matter what rule you're looking at as it relates to the government, the government is the party giving their informed consent confirmed in writing. So whether you're going from um, the government work to private practice, the government gives their informed consent in writing. Or if you're going from private practice to governmental work, the government gives their informed consent confirmed in writing. So that's the nice thing. You really can't guess wrong with regard to this rule. So I want to turn to the example on this point uh, there under because I think it's really helpful in fleshing this out. It says that a lawyer did zoning ordinance work in private practice for a company where he challenged the zoning ordinances. The lawyer then leaves private practice to work in the public sector for the government where he rewrites zoning ordinances he used to challenge. While working for the government, the lawyer would need informed consent in writing from the governmental agency where he was working due to the nature of his previous work in the private sector. So you can see again who is consenting. The next part of this rule, it's not over yet, says that you may not negotiate for private employment with any person who's involved as a party or as a lawyer for a party in a matter in which you're participating personally and substantially. Now, the one exception to this, though, is law, uh, lawyers who are law clerks working for a judge or another type of adjudicative officer, or if you're an arbitrator. Now, these guys are allowed to negotiate for private employment um, as the rules would otherwise allow. And I think the policy behind this is those jobs are very temporary in nature and, and the rules recognize the need to be able to negotiate for employment because of the temporary nature of the positions. So that wraps up all of those conflict of interest rules that we're going to be talking about together. Remember, uh, this portion of the rules is the most highly tested subsection. What we would recommend you do is not only read through the rules and try to memorize them, but if you're a visual learner, focus on this chart too that we provided for you. It's a great way to see what the rule is um, and how to break it down and if there's any way around the rule.